Okay, guys, today we're going to talk about buffers. Let me explain to you what a buffer is. A buffer prevents huge changes, big swings in pH. And the most important um, places to um, avoid those big changes are in the blood and the bodily fluids. And you really have two types of uh, buffers. You have uh, chemical buffers. These are chemicals, and they work fast, right? But they're limited. You don't have an unlimited amount of chemicals in your blood. And then you have physiologic buffers. These are systems. These take longer to act, but in some cases, they're able to correct uh, any pH disturbance. And the two systems that are used as physiologic um, buffers are the respiratory system, because they control carbon dioxide levels, and the kidneys, they co control by carbonate levels in the blood. And again, real simply, right, you want to maintain a balance between free floating hydrogen and free floating bicarbonate. And again, the primary base of the body is bicarbonate. And it works as a buffer as well. So Let's get into this a little bit. And again, we talked about this before, that the cardiovascular system, the only place that nutrients and gases are exchanged in the cells of the body are at the systemic capillary in the cell. So here you got a cell. Yeah. And then you have the blood. And in the arterial end of the capillary, you have oxygen. So this is the arterial end. And one of the byproducts of metabolism that you got to get rid of is carbon dioxide. So O2 by diffusion, simple diffusion, high concentration to low through a selectively permeable membrane. It's going to go into the cell so you can use it as aerobic for aerobic metabolism to make ATP. And then the byproduct of that aerobic metabolism is carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide will diffuse from high concentration in the cell through a selectively permeable membrane to low concentration in the blood. And it is this point where the gases are exchanged that arterial blood becomes venous blood. All right, so. Here we go. So what we're talking about, again, is what happens at the level of the cell. So you have the systemic capillary, and then you have the cell. Now, let's say, for example, that through metabolism, through making ATP inside our cells, you start producing extra. hydrogen ions. Those are going to go from high concentration in the blood to low concentration in the cell, or high concentration in the cell, low concentration in the blood. So the amount of free-floating hydrogen ions is going to go up. And if that continues, it's going to drop the pH. But circulating in your blood, you have a chemical buffer called bicarbonate. And what bicarbonate can do is it can grab those free-floating hydrogen ions and not make them free-floating anymore. And if bicarbonate grabs that hydrogen ion and prevents it from being free-floating, didn't get rid of it, what it did is it locked it up in carbonic acid. So what bicarbonate did is it buffered this hydrogen ion. Didn't get rid of it, it's still there, but it's combined with bicarbonate to form carbonic acid. So if you look, what would happen to the circulating level of bicarbonate if the cells, through metabolism, are making extra hydrogen ions and dumping them into the blood? 
If that's the case, it's going to combine, bicarbonate is going to combine with that free-floating hydrogen ion, lock it up in carbonic acid. So the circulating level of bicarbonate will decrease. That is the definition of a metabolic acidosis. If the cells are making too much hydrogen ion through metabolism, it is going to attempt to lower that pH, but that bicarbonate level is, that bicarbonate is going to combine with that hydrogen ion, lock it up in carbonic acid. So the amount of circulating level of bicarbonate is going to go down. So one example of a chemical buffer in the body is bicarbonate. Now, another example, right, is the big freaking protein in your blood called albumin. Albumin is a big protein in your blood produced by the liver. And it has several functions. One of its big functions is to transport electrolytes around in the blood. Right? So think of albumin as kind of like a bus that transports electrolytes, but it can also be used to buffer free floating hydrogen ions. So here you go, you got the cell again. And again, let's say through metabolism, the cells are making more hydrogen ions than normal and dumping them into the blood. Boom. If that hydrogen ion remains free floating, it will drop your pH. But that hydrogen ion can be picked up by the albumin bus. So these are little sh seats on the albumin bus. And hydrogen ions can take a seat there. So if that albumin binds that free-floating hydrogen ion, what did it do to it? It buffered it, right? It's no longer free-floating. So this is how albumin works as a chemical buffer. It prevents free-floating hydrogen ions from being free-floating. Now, the other thing that albumin can do is it can transport electrolytes around in the body. And remember, the goal of the body is to maintain homeostasis, right? So, again, you get the cell. The cell starts producing hydrogen ions, excess through metabolism, dumping them into the blood. What do you got in your blood? You got the big freaking protein albumin. And albumin has little seats on the bus. And the wheels of the bus go round and round. Now, one of the things that it will do is it will also transport electrolytes, like calcium, right? You store about 99% of your calcium in bones. So if this cell needed calcium for some reason, let's just say it did, would it make sense to have to go to your bones, break down the calcium that makes up your bones, dump it into the blood, and get it into the cell? No. What would make more sense is that if you had a way of transporting electrolytes around in the blood, but they wouldn't affect the physiology of your cells. The only thing that can affect the physiology of your cells is free-floating calcium. Calcium that's sitting on the albumin bus can't affect it. Now, you also have calcium that's floating around in your blood, right? 9.5 to 10.5 milliequivalents per liter. But you also have, now, 
because your metabolism is jacked up, extra free floating hydrogen ions. So what will happen is this. Calcium and the hydrogen will compete for seats on the albumin bus. And it is more important to maintain the pH than it is blood levels of calcium. So if the hydrogen ion wins, which it should, the albumin has buffered it, but this calcium that could have took that seat now doesn't have a seat, right? Because you got some hydrogen ions here and you got some calcium here, right? They're all taken up. Yeah. So if this hydrogen ion, which normally isn't produced unless your metabolism screwy, is going to take that seat and it's not going to allow that calcium to bind there. So an acidosis leads to high levels of free floating calcium in the blood. So acidosis causes hypercalcemia. Now, let's say, for example, that the cells of the body aren't making enough hydrogen ions, right? So if you're not making enough hydrogen ions, right, what's going to happen to your pH? Your pH is going to go up. That's bad for you. Where do you store some extra hydrogen ions that aren't free floating? Well, on the albumin bus. So what will happen in the case of an alkalosis is that hydrogen that was in, on that bus hops off and becomes free floating. And that extra hydrogen ion is going to cause the pH to drop back to normal. But now what have you done? You have freed up a seat on the albumin bus for calcium. So alkalosis leads to hypocalcemia. And that's how I would like it explained. If you tell me that acidosis causes hypercalcemia without explaining it, I'm going to mark it wrong. You explain it to me. Now, a couple of other things. An acidosis and we're just going to take this on faith right now until we talk about it, causes the central nervous system to be depressed. So it, de um, it decreases neural activity. Acidosis decreases neural activity. And what's the lowest neural activity you can be without being dead? That's, of course, coma. Now, of course, the body does stuff that makes sense. Now, think about it. If an acidosis causes decreased neural activity, what's an alkalosis going to do? Yep. An alkalosis, alkalosis increases neural activity. And what's the most neural activity you can have without being dead? That's seizure. So alkalosis increases neural activity. Alkalosis causes hypocalcemia. So alkalosis can lead to seizure. Acidosis decreases neural activity and increases calcium levels. And if it's severe enough, it can lead to coma. Now, remember that these chemical buffers are limited. 
You're limited in the number of seats on the bus. You're limited in terms of the amount of circulating by carbon that you have in your blood. So there are systems in your body that will help regulate that pH. And the two systems, again, are the respiratory system, which controls CO2 levels in the blood, and the kidneys, which control bicarbonate. So if we look, So if you recall, the functional unit of the kidney is the nephron. And one of the things that the nephron can do, the nephron can filter bicarbonate into the urine, right? So the glomerulus little spaghetti strainer, it will filter the plasma of the blood, and bicarbonate ends up in these collecting tubules. Hydrogen ions, on the other hand, are, have a difficult time being filtered. So, now watch. If there is an increase in the amount of free-floating hydrogen ions in the blood, right, what can buffer those? Bicarbonate. So if you have an acidosis because you have increased amounts of free-floating hydrogen ions, right, you have a drop in pH. The kidneys, whoops, you have a drop in pH. The kidneys can help out. And how the kidneys help out is they reabsorb the bicarbonate back into the blood. And they secrete the hydrogen ions into the urine. So if you reabsorb the bicarbonate, right, and get rid of the hydrogen ions, Bicarbonate's a base, so if there's more base in the blood, boy, then the pH will go up. So how does the kidney help regulate pH? In an acidosis, it reabsorbs bicarbonate back into the blood that was going to get peed out, and that secretes the hydrogen ions into the collecting tubules so you can pee that hydrogen out, that acid out. Um, the opposite is true. If you have an alkalosis where your pH is elevated, what will happen is the kidney simply will not reabsorb this bicarbonate, and it's a base. So your pH is basic. So do you want to hold on to base? No. You want to pee that base out into the toilet. So that's how the kidneys can help control pH. And with the respiratory system, right, where's the only place that nutrients and gases are exchanged? At the level of the systemic capillary in the cell, but gases are exchanged at the level of the pulmonary capillary and the alveoli, right? So in this case, what we have is we got the cell right? And the cell produces CO2. Cell membrane, capillary membrane, one cell membrane thick. The CO2 is going to diffuse into the blood, right? All venous blood, all venous blood goes to the right side of the heart, right? So all the veins of the body are going to dump their venous blood into the right side of the heart. That blood that's in the right side of the heart is high in carbon dioxide. Where is that venous blood going to go? It's going to go through the pulmonary trunk, the left and right pulmonary arteries, and you can see the circulatory system within the lungs gets smaller until it terminates those pulmonary arteries and arterioles are ultimately going to terminate 
at the level of the pulmonary capillary, right, and the alveoli. So you got your alveoli, which is one cell membrane thick, and your palm cap. which is one cell membrane thick. That blood is high in CO2. The alveoli is low in CO2. CO2 is an acid, right? So in the lungs, if you remove that CO2, you are removing acid. So that's how the respiratory system helps control acid-base balance in the body. I hope that helped. And I'll see you.